let's get into topical estriol and estriol. Do they actually work for postmenopausal skin? Um, so first things first, what is the difference between the two? Just know that both of these are actually forms of estrogen. However, mm-hmm. estradiol is actually the dominant form of estrogen throughout the majority of our lives, whereas estriol is actually the dominant form of estrogen when we're pregnant. They actually call this the pregnancy hormone. They, it's considered the weaker hormone, and it's used as an alternative, as a more gentle, possibly safer. Um, but we're going to get into what safer actually means in this section. So let's get into it. Yeah, to start, uh, we should mention that topical estradiol and estriol are not very new. They've actually been mm. testing this for decades now. Um, some mm-hmm. of the oldest papers come from the 70s, 80s. So there's been a lot of work in this arena, and we should mention um, that all of this is under prescription care, at least in the U.S. What that means is when topicals have this long history, it means review papers that you have to work for us. And then we happen to find a pretty good one that kind of lays out everything that's been done from like the 80s all the way to the 2000s. Um, and as you can see, this has been tested topically over and over again. This isn't this isn't something that just goes from oral to off and to a vaguely logical translation to topical evidence. Topical estrogen has been tested. And I'll just put the general chart up there. It's hard to see because there's a lot of papers to go off of. Um, but we just wanna, I just wanna highlight a couple of key studies here before we get into a couple interesting ones we, uh, we found. Between estradiol and estriol, I think when you do research in this, uh, in this category, you'll see a lot of talks about uh, between the difference between estradiol and estriol. And there's definitely that rhetoric of like estradiol is the better one because like Victoria mentioned, estriol is considered the weaker estrogen. But the reality is topically, there's actually a lot of data comparing the two at just yes. different levels. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, comparative data. This is what <laughs> happens when you have decades of testing. Um, mm-hmm. So estriol is used at 0.3%, while estradiol is used at 0.01%. And when used at that level, a lot of studies seem to show that it's fairly on par in terms of performance. First of all, this is a really good sign in a realm where we just don't have a lot uh, in skincare. Um, but definitely want to point out um, a couple comparative studies here. This was done back in 94 and 96, where they actually looked at 0.3% estriol versus 0.01% estradiol. Now, the first one that was done in 94, this is very small. They only did it on 18 subjects. But we should point out that this study was actually done for six months. Um, very, and very we can. Long. Yeah, and we can tell you that if you look, if you scroll through this nice summary of data, you'll see that for the most part, this duration that they test is a lot longer than probably what you guys are used to. Um, I think there are some that go um, for as long as a year, which is good news, um, but also should give you a sense of timeline and length of time you might be using these products for. In terms of results that were seen, they were actually targeting anti-aging skin concerns such as firmness, elasticity, vascularization, moisture, wrinkle depth, and pore size. In terms of both groups, they did see that both did see a general improvement. However, in the in this study, they did mention that topical estriol groups at the 0.3% were slightly superior to those of estradiol group. They mentioned that, and when they say slightly, that usually means it's not significant. So probably right. for the most part, this these two percentages are on par. But let's take a look at the second one. The second one, um, same thing. They're looking at 0.01% estradiol versus 0.3% estriol, testing it for the same time length of six months. Uh, subject size is a lot bigger. You're looking at 59 subjects at a time. I say a lot, it's just bigger. Um, but they had this, they had subjects apply it on face and neck. Mm-hmm. And they did see that elasticity and firmness on skin were significantly improved. As long as well as wrinkle depth and pore size for both treatments. They actually looked at type 3 collagen as well, um, did find an increase in both groups. So, just with these two studies, as an intro, this is obviously not enough um, data. We're just running through a couple comparisons. You can see that for the most part, these two con- concentrations can be considered comparable. So, generally good signs. Yeah. And another, uh, there's a lot more than what we're highlighting here, but these are just ones that we think are interesting and have good takeaways. Mm -hmm. Um, The studies didn't stop in the 90s. There is a study in early 2000s that looked at 0.01 estradiol compared with a placebo. And they're Mm -hmm. able to measure um, epidermal thickness increase significantly by 23% when compared to the control. And they also measure things like epidermal thickness. And something else to note when I went through this review paper in these studies is 
uh, what's interesting is they didn't. A lot of the papers don't just look at things that's more, I guess, external result of, of uh, because of the estrogen. It's now things yeah. like hydration or wrinkles appear to be less. Though some of them do look at that. A lot of them straight up took biopsies, and that's why you hear mm. phrases like epidermal thickness improved or collagen level went up. These are mm-hmm. all um, more in-depth looks at uh, uh, at skin, which when we cover our other episodes on the uh, on other topicals, not all of them do these types of studies. But on the flip side, we also see very few studies that talked about the cosmetic end result of estrogen creams. It just seems like after all these time, things tend to trend better, but um, mm-hmm. not so much. But but it's hard to tell like what. Um, how you feel about skin in that time. One other really interesting study I want to call out here is done in 2008. This one is uh, the complete opposite of these six month studies we just shared. It's only for two weeks and I actually tested a mm. bunch of different levels of estradiol from the standard 0.01 all the way up to 2.5. Um, but that's not what, what I want to discuss here. What they did was they actually tested on the forearm and the hip. So mm. as part of skin that's naturally exposed to sun on the regular, um, just as we live, versus a part of skin that's very rarely exposed to sun directly. Their whole sh- uh, the, the whole point of this paper is kind of, kind of to show that how does photo aging come into play when it comes to topical estrogen? And in this really short duration study, they actually showed that all levels of estradiol was able to increase um, collagen production. And they actually showed that it was able to boost collagen production for hip skin, so for skin that is not photo damaged. Whereas that mm. same effect isn't observed on the forearm and face. So the, uh, because it's a really short study, I think it's not to say that as topical estrogen wouldn't work on your face. It's kind of to show that how important sun protection is. Because if your skin comes with photo damage already, this one paper does seem to suggest that it has an even harder time taking up anything signaling. I actually wanted to add to that is that like, um, just not within this review paper, but there are several of there out there that debate, you know, what is the goal of estradiol topically and the types of aging, photo aging, chrono aging. I think what's reassuring for me as I went through this is that they are looking at this in a very analytical way, in a Mm -hmm. much better way than most anti-aging ingredients. Mm -hmm. And aside from this clinical, there's been multiple mentions of how Estradiol is meant specifically for chrono aging, and when they mean chrono aging, yeah. postmenopausal aging versus photo aging, there they see that there is a discrepancy, and I actually really like that because a lot of times what happens with anti aging research is it all just gets lumped in and smashed together, and they're just looking at the final, the final uh, skin concern, which is wrinkle. Like, right. I don't care how you got the wrinkle. I don't care what that is. It's just the wrinkle, you know, or that pigmentation that you got. And I, so I really liked how analytical some of these, mm-hmm. um, these aspects they were trying to look at through some of this research. You know, that's a great point. And I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here because yeah. when you do product research, a lot of companies that sell these creams will actually suggest, hey, you can use this alongside, say, a tretinoin. And mm-hmm. tretinoin is, uh, or like vitamin A in general, is tested very specifically for photo aging aspects of skin. And it kind of does make, uh, it does make a lot of sense that these two are tackling aging from very, very different angles. And mm-hmm. you're absolutely right. I don't think chrono aging is, a, is an arena people, um, that's usually separated out from photo aging. And I think the yeah. vast majority of research is dedicated to photo aging. Yeah, I mean, how many clinicals, and I'm sure, Gloria, we can also talk about, like, when you're curating clinical studies, they all get lumped in as looking at photo aging concerns. Yes, yes. But that is not necessarily, if you want to get really technical, like, Mm -hmm. that's not actually looked at as critically as, let's say, even in this, in that clinical you just shared. Like, a lot of times it's like, I don't think they're actually making that differentiation of what is photo aging and what is chrono aging, you know, Mm -hmm. so... Yeah. Uh, so all those are the, uh, and there are a lot more, there are a lot of other studies that I mm-hmm. didn't cover that tends to look at just say forearm or mm-hmm. patches or even in vitro studies. I did pull the paper that Victoria mentioned from 96 to look at more, uh, in, in more detail. Uh, just a quick refresher. This was done for six months. There's about 30 test subjects per group. Group one used 0.01% estradiol. Group two uses 0.3% estrogen cream and just mm. um just to reiterate the average age here is 53 
and mm. all the su- study participants are at least peri or postmenopausal. And I'm just going to read the results super quickly. They say that after treatment, elasticity and firmness of skin has markedly improved, and wrinkle depth and pore size have decreased from 61 to 100 percent in both groups. Uh, the 61 to 100 percent seems a little bit out there, but sure. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> They also did biopsy. On the immunohistochemical side, significant increase in type 3 po- collagen labeling were combined with increased number of collagen fibers at the end of the treatment period. Uh, and what's really nifty and what I should point out from the review paper is all these longer term topical studies, they are required to um, draw blood from the subjects mm. and measure the uh, blood hormone level. And they mm. show that their internal levels have no systemic effects from the topical treatment. So um, if you're worried about estrogen getting your bloodstream and somehow having uh, further implications than intended, it has been shown over and over again that that's not how topicals work here. And I really wanted to pull the study because of two things. One is this study showed that there is no um, side effects. There's no irritation. There is mm. um, no onboarding period. This is uh, as topical estrogen is pretty mild to use for all subjects. Of the review paper, they also mentioned that of the all the studies that's been done, there's no cases, barely any cases of sensitization. And they actually included a before after picture. Victoria, how do we feel about the before after picture? I mean... The lady looks like she took it from two different ages. Like, <laughs> yeah. It, like aside from the clearly the same style of applying eyeliner and the eye shape, I'd be like, this was taken in two different decades. Like, I do not believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So, I one of the things I find to be super interesting about this research is it's very scientifically rigorous, right? There's a lot. Yeah. There's biopsies, immunohistostain staining. Mm-hmm. There is collagen measurement, even mRNA markers, da da da, all that stuff but very, very, very few things to go off of in terms of the cosmetic expectations. When we're talking about less, more hydrating, how much more hydrating? When we're talking about Mm. less wrinkles, how much? This was the only picture I can pull. I pulled probably like half a dozen papers. Um, This was the only one I can pull. And like Victoria mentioned, and for our audio listeners, it's a black and white picture that's very zoomed in on the eye area. Um, Mm -hmm. Because it's black and white, I can't really tell if it's... um, if it's taking a very controlled setting or if it's like a Polaroid mm-hmm. camera. But it basically looked like her crow's feet went from something you might expect in your 60s um, level of crow's feet to no crow's feet. Like if yeah. I told you based on the after picture that this woman's in her 40s, you'd be like, okay, that looks about right. Yeah, exactly. And granted, this this study was done in 96. So the instrumentation back then, I mean, it's not, it's understandable. It's not to knock like the tool, like, you know, their abilities. Um, But yeah, it's just, it's wild. And it has me wondering, I'm like, you know, really dry skin. <laughs> like, If you have really dry skin and you can solve your hydration issues, I'm like, that goes far. I mean, yeah, that can go pretty far. Can it go this far? I'm not sure because this is a wild, wild change, but I can't imagine it can go pretty far. <laughs> I'll be honest, like doing what we do and as someone that has by default pretty dry skin, I'm like, oh, I am not ready for that pose menopause, like extra dryness. But yeah. I will say like, like Victoria mentioned, like we always preach that cleanse, moisturize, sun protection is the pillars of, you know, 90% of your skin needs. As someone with dry skin, like, you know, before you dive into the actives, just look at what just moisturizing can do. <laughs> Make sure your skin barrier is in tip-top shape. Yeah, for sure. I also really like the table um, that you shared here, just because of a few things. One is looking at, you know, the general improvement across the subjects, I think is always an important stat that doesn't often get shared. And the reason why we like this stat is because, um, you can have a subject scenario where a couple have like fantastic improvement and the yeah. rest really don't have great improvement and that can really skew the results that you're seeing. It's just funny to me because it's like pore size is always that one that you're just like, I don't really know. <laughs> like it's just like a why, it's, but it's yeah, there. It's har- the hardest one, I would say, of all the skin concerns to really get good data. It's like really tough. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, now that I totally. Well, I forgot about this chart, but 
now that Victoria brought it up, uh, I pulled this chart because I find it to be mildly humorous. Because, um, so first of all, like Victoria mentioned, the number of subjects that show improvement is a very important metric for us. And on the estradiol side, almost uh, everyone showed improvement in terms of vascularization, skin elasticity, firmness, and moisture, which is expected to be the main main concerns that this can target. And wrinkle depth, 87% of people show improvement. Pore size, 73% of the subjects showed improvement. On the estriol side, it's honestly pretty on par. Um, 96% show in, uh, improvement in vascularization, elasticity, firmness, and moisture. 89% show wrinkle depth, and 61% show improvement in pore size. I think it's humorous because I'm sitting here like, is it the same one person in yes. that show yes. that showed no improvement across the board? That person got shafted. <laughs> yes, that's exactly correct. That's what I was feeling. <laughs> I was like, oh no, to be the one person in the group like, my skin's fine. After six months, and didn't do anything great. <laughs> yeah, I know. Rough. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so all that, all those studies we just find to be interesting and kind of it paints a good picture as to what it does, which is to improve skin barrier fun- function, and that topical estrogen does work. Um, I will say one of the key takeaways here is the biggest biggest positive is in all of our years, um, the, in all the years that Victoria and I have been doing content, there are very few arenas where people will look very specifically at aged skin, at mm. peri- and post-menopausal skin. Um, mm-hmm. Some anti-aging studies that age group might bleed into that realm, but usually it will also go down and include people in their like 30s and 40s. So of all the topicals, we would say it's definitely worth trying if you're in the age bracket because so few topicals look at that more mature skin type. In terms of safety of these um, topical hormones, we should mention that all of the controversy really starts from around the early 2000s. Basically, what happened is there was a hormone therapy clinical trial that was being run. This was actually Mm -hmm. being run by the NIH, um, and it actually was stopped midway. And because of uh, that study in particular, um, a lot of fear was generated Mm. and a knee-jerk reaction happened where suddenly no one wanted to prescribe hormone therapy um, for perimenopausal women because they were so afraid of potential adverse side effects. But what we can tell you is, one, remember that this clinical trial, they were actually doing, um, they were offering oral hormones, and this was not just for topical skincare. Uh, This was actually for other symptoms of menopause. And Two, remember that this is topical application of estradiol and estriol. This is very far removed from this original clinical trial. So hopefully that gives you some historical context as to like where the uh, misunderstanding comes from. Um, so ultimately, all that to say is, you know, if you are generally concerned and you feel like you've read something that might make you feel like this is, um, you're not sure whether or not this is right for you. The good thing is this is a prescription. And Mm -hmm. in order to get a prescription, that means you need to have a conversation with your doctor and your doctor will ultimately be the one to tell you if this is the best solution for you, given your, not only your skin history, but your health history and your general family history regarding your health. So um, yeah, we just don't feel like this should be a general reason not to consider this avenue. Yeah, 100%. And just, just to wrap it all up to you, all the studies we share, like we briefly mentioned, in these studies, the women are only doing topical estrogen and mm. not doing more systemic hormonal therapies. Uh, yeah. And it shows that topically, uh, and they do draw blood regularly to see um, blood estrogen level and check on it all the time. Topically, it doesn't affect your blood estrogen level. Uh, obviously, other than topical, um, topical estrogen, there are other forms of hormone therapies. And all of this, including topical estrogen, like Victoria mentioned, is a conversation to be had with your doctor. Uh, So that about wraps up the meat. We'll take a quick break 